Hi, I'm Kevin Murray, editor of Garland, and I'm speaking to you from Nam, Melbourne, whose traditional owners are the Wurundjeri people of the Kulin Nation, where it's Gwangal Moron, native honeybee season now, which is our autumn. And I pay my respect to their elders past and present and the ancestors of the lands where, where you come from. Today, now with your permission, we'll share our learnings over the course of the next hour. The Reinventing the Wheel series is an initiative of the, goal of the Knowledge House for Craft, an association of thinkers and makers that aims to reflect the global diversity of our field. Each of these talks becomes a spoke in the wheel, a growing repository of craft knowledge. And I wish to acknowledge my colleagues in this endeavor who are present, uh, Liliana Murray, uh, Murray, Ben Liniel, Arti Kolra, Sharon Tang Delista, uh, and Trisha Flanagan, who's also here. In this series, we've heard from Arti Kolra on Rabindranath Tagore, Layla Al Hamad on the Arab focus on smell, Lagi Mama on the customary Moana perspective, Linda McIntosh on royalty in Laotian craft, Joseph and Dioni on the One Village, One Product movement, Hayoung Cho on the role of universities in modern Korean craft, Ezra Shales on industrial craft in the, the US, a session with the Journal of Modern Craft on the mask as a pandemic craft, Trisha Flanagan on the haptic interface, Professor Annie Ying Cheng on the development of the Chinese workstation, Sachiko Tomashiga on Japanese mirror craft in ancient Japan, Liliana Murray and Sylvia Sasioka on Brazilian Minge, Sharon Sang Delista on refugee craft and Belsu Forest on craft and French national identity. Inspired by the discourse of our Tongan colleagues, we call on the previous speaker to offer a, a salutation. And uh, I'm very pleased to uh, share with you the salutation from uh, Marty Gross, who introduces to the world of the Minge Film Archive now. Unfortunately, it's around 4 a.m. in the morning in Toronto where Marty is, so he can't join us. But uh, he sends his regards, his best wishes, and uh, he wanted to, to add the phrase by the US writer, Wendell Berry, uh, for our inspiration, which is working with the given world. And I think that fits quite well with what uh, Kamya Sharma will be sharing with us. So Kamya Sharma is a founding member of the Knowledge House for Craft. What I found challenging in Kamya's work is how she questions the romantic view of craft as a good in itself, something that can lead to cozy nostalgia if left unchecked. She does this by seeking to represent the interests of those individuals who are directly involved. Her story on for Garland on Dari's reflected the experience of hosts who perform an authenticity for tourists. Her article on sartorial biomoralism questions the aesthetic hierarchy that puts hand woven, sorry, hand woven cotton and silk above machine made polyester. And today she further develops the perspective of the user drawing on a book she is writing based on her doctoral research on dress and colonialism in Southern India. I think Kamya will open up in a very interesting way the broader question about the role of the user in our understanding of craft. So with great anticipation, Kamya, I hand it over to you. Thank you so much, Kevin. Um, as always, your very thoughtful introduction gives me new perspectives on my own work. Um, thanks to everyone who carved time out of their uh, very busy schedules to be here. It's, it's great to have you here. And I'm really looking forward to your perspectives on my work. Um, as Kevin mentioned, uh, the talk that I'm going to offer today is uh, based on research that I'm conducting for a book that I'm writing uh, on the cultural history of the sari. 
So I am going to be um, alternatively speaking and reading uh, excerpts from the book, which is very much a work in progress. And uh, I guess without further ado, let me get right into it. I am going to share my screen now, I hope. Is that visible? Great. All right. Okay, so um, first things first, I wanted to talk about one of the things that inspired this research, uh, which is uh, the writer Amita Ghosh, a wonderful writer who weaves history and fiction together, his novel, The Glass Palace. And this is actually a very brief excerpt from the novel itself. I'm going to read it out now. The first thing he noticed about them was that the new Madame Collector was dressed in an unusual garment. Puzzled, he handed his binoculars to the queen. What's that she's wearing? The queen took a long look. It's just a sari, she said at last, but she's wearing it in a new style. So this new style, this unusual garment, this is sort of the genesis behind uh, my research. Um, Amitabh Ghosh's The Glass Palace describes the vicissitudes in the lives of the Burmese royal family after the successful British invasion of Burma in the late 19th century. As they are exiled to small, remote Ratnagiri in present-day Maharashtra, which is in Western India, Queen Supalayat, the Burmese queen, and the four princesses have to negotiate the challenges of life in this partially familiar but still alien land. In 1905, a new district collector arrives in town with his wife in tow. He's a Bengali man from Calcutta, which is in Eastern India. The queen notices that his wife, Uma De, is wearing her sari differently, quote unquote, with odds and ends borrowed from European costume, a petticoat, a blouse. Furthermore, she had heard women from all over India were adopting the new style. Uma, who impresses the queen with her language, self-possession, and poise, then proceeds to tell the royal family how to wear the sari in this new style. So Ghosh's ability to sort of weave history and fiction together allows him to set up the scene, which is characterized by a complex social milieu uh, with many shifting and sort of contingent identities. Um, for all the reifications around nas uh, national gender, class, and caste identities that would follow, nothing is as it seems at the, at the turn of the 20th century. The Mermi's queen is quite adept at speaking Hindustani, for instance, whereas many of the Indian civil servants who were of Bengali origin at that point were not. The new style of wearing the sari comes late to Ratnagiri, implying that this mode is already popular in the heart of the colonial presidencies, especially Bombay. Uh, the queen approves of the style because it remains, reminds her of the Burmese Tamen, uh, speaking to the sari's ability to occupy a sort of cosmopolitan visual template and running quite contrary to discourses that embedded firmly and solely in Indian tradition. Uh, this encounter between an exiled foreign royal and a civil servant's wife also affords us a glimpse into the role that women who moved in the social circles of the colonial bureaucracy played in influencing the fashions of the time. Um, so the collector's wife in this narrative and also in India is a key cultural figure who potentially played a vital role in spreading metropolitan or nationalist tastes to the peri-urban and rural parts of India. The new sari drape in question here is identified by various monikers, the Navi sari, the Southern sari, the Brahmika sari, to name just a few. In some parts of North India, it is also re uh, referred to by the draping style, which is ulta palu, ulta meaning reverse. Um, it is believed to have been developed by a Bengali aristocrat in the mid 19th century and popularized by the nationalist movement. Now, how did the Nivi Sari go from being an unusual garment, as seen in this quote, to op occupying such a dominant role in shaping the visual culture of independent India? In a sociocultural context marked by such diversity, the, sari, the Nivi Sari drape is uh, surprising in its very ubiquity and universality. By and large, it translates fairly seamlessly across social contexts. It occupies a dominant position in women's wear retail and is a vital part of India's visual and material culture. Uh, so these are some of the questions that animate this research. Before I go any further, let me very briefly introduce the sari. 
um, the lack of uh, written sources that can point to an accurate, well, sort of that can delineate the genealogy of the sari for us are unfortunately unavailable. So most of the insights that scholars have are drawn from uh, archaeology, art history, and, and the kinds of evidences that are available to those disciplines. Um, Linda Linden, for instance, records the existence of a North Indian terracotta figurine from about 100 BC of a woman wearing a sari with uh, the sari sort of draped between the legs, which is known as the kacha style. Um, sculptures of the Gandhara civilization, which is 50 BC to 300 AD, cave paintings at Ajanta, which is late 5th century, all depict women in saris of different styles. Um, described largely as a length of woven cloth measuring roughly anywhere between 2 to 12 yards draped around the body, the sari may form part of a two or three part ensemble, such as a skirt and a blouse, uh, or two pieces of shorter cloth. So. It is, it is a fairly fluid garment, even in terms of uh, definition. The sari's elemental structure is generally considered to be determined by the weaving, consisting of a body, borders, running along the length, and an end piece that is described as a pallavar pallu. Uh, the borders and the pallu may be contrasted from the body by higher degrees of ornamentation or contrasts in color. Now, of course, even this elemental structure uh, will very often be subverted uh, if it is a completely plain um, sari where the body and the where the borders and the pallu are not distinguished from the body. Uh, there, this elemental structure will not necessarily play a role. Um, but this is just to give you some insight into how a woven sari uh, will generally look. Um, in this talk, I specifically wish to focus on the question of drape and wish to make the case that drape too is a form of craft and that uh, it may allow us to broaden our perspectives uh, about craft as beyond making alone to looking at objects in use, the way objects are used, cared for, cared for maintained and disposed of, and how they morph over the course of these um, various points in their journey as objects. So uh, these are some uh, representations of uh, various saris that were worn in the 19th century. As you can see, there is a fair degree of diversity even here. So the second point that I also wish to make is that the popularization of the Nivi drape has engendered new forms of making. Uh, this is something that I will discuss in greater detail in the second half of my talk. So for me, uh, the fact that this, is, this drape is a form of craft and this craft engendered in its turn other forms of making uh, says that essentially the cultural history of the Nivi Sari is fundamentally a story about craft, one that links histories of production and consumption. Uh, these are uh, watercolor paintings that were made by a famous artist from Bombay, uh, at, essentially in the first half of the 20th century. Um, and his name was uh, M.D. Dhurandar. Dhurandar is fairly famous. Uh, his, his, uh, I think his watercolors are even available to order online today. But what makes him useful for us is that he, he rendered a lot of women in different forms of clothing uh, and essentially gave us a snapshot of the different forms of clothing that were prevalent in the Indian subcontinent at the time. And Perhaps he also inspired uh, visual templates that were to come if, if, uh, in any kind of renderings of unity and diversity uh, for the Indian context. And uh, so this is just to give you an idea of the different kinds of drapes that were prevalent in the time. The, this picture, the one, uh, to the, the one in the middle, for instance, shows the Maharashtrian Brahmin lady and she's wearing the sari drape between her legs. But for instance, the picture to her right in this, is a kind of drape that um, I have found prevalent uh, amongst the uh, members of the royal family in Mysore, where I'm currently based. And that kind of sari is not worn drape between the legs, which is all essentially to say that there was tremendous diversity in drape at this time. And it need not have naturally followed that the Navi sari would acquire the level of popularity and universality that it would eventually do. So, um, Despite widespread recognition among scholars of dress and costume that drape is a significant element of clothing, it has received little attention even in this colony niche of dress studies. 
Uh, in Indian dress history, the draped stitched distinction has been invested with special salience. It has been given religious, social, and cultural significance. Some believe that stitched clothing was brought to the subcontinent by the Islamic invasions while others are able to find are even able to find evidence of stitched or sewn clothing uh, from the Vedic age, which would mean at least as old as 500 BC. Uh, even so, we have little documented information about the variety of drapes that existed in the Indian subcontinent. One thing that, um, especially as practitioners of craft in this forum, we can all acknowledge is that drape was not merely functional, but also decorative, as is evident even from this uh, visual. The ingenuity of many drapes attests to the fact that drape was as much a form of adornment as jewelry or maybe an elaborate headdress. Um, one uh, work on drapes from the 1990s is uh, particularly useful in this regard, which is uh, Shantol Boulanger's work on sari drapes. And uh, it is a work that breaks down the various drapes. Um, and rather than going by provenance, she classifies drapes by similarity of method, finding connections across geographies of the Indian subcontinent. More recently, Border and Fall, the Indian magazine's anthology of sari drapes, uh, is uh, something that's been uh, extremely useful in documenting the versatility and ingenuity of drapes found in India. Border and Fall has also been covered in a very thoughtful interview by Garland. Now, uh, if we were to look at the Navi Sari, the origin of the Navi Sari again has uh, contested uh, histories. Charles Fabry, uh, a famous um, archaeologist and art historian, uh, claims that the Navi Sari was probably born around 1780 when the Dupatta, which is uh, essentially a piece of woven cloth that is uh, draped over the shoulders or worn just on to hang on one shoulder. Uh, when the dupatta was extended to form a sari and worn with a blouse and petticoat. Other studies claim that the Navi sari was actually part of a school of drapes that was commonly worn in Andhra Pradesh in Southern India. Hence it also going by the name Southern Sari. Uh, Shantal Boulanger's study of the uh, drapes of the Indian subcontinent has an entire section dedicated to Navi drapes, which he also classifies as those drapes that are not worn in the kacha style. That is drapes that are not draped, tucked between the legs and then tucked in at the waist at the back. Um, she's also able to establish similarities between the Navi saris and the drapes that she presents from Andhra Pradesh, giving further credence to the possibility that the Navi sari was adapted from drapes of Southern India. But uh, many scholars, in fact, most scholars, I would say, are in agreement that the modern Navi sari, as we see and know it today, is a variation of the Parsi gara, which is what you are saying here, made popular in Gujarat in Western India, worn with a blouse and petticoat. Uh, the modern Navi drape of the sari is believed to have been worn first by Nyanada Nandini Devi, wife of uh, civil servant Satyendra Nath Tagore and sister-in-law of Rabindra Nath Tagore. As the wife of a man of importance, she was obliged to be a representative public figure. Nyanada Nandini Devi is also believed to have adapted to this drape to uh, have something suitable to wear when accompanying her husband to social occasions. Now, this must be understood in the kind of social and cultural context prevalent at the, in the time. Um, when the couple moved to Bombay in 1864, it gave them the opportunity to absorb practices prevalent in Western India, especially in female dress. It was here that Nyanada Nandini, with her husband's active encouragement, adopted the embellished blouses and petticoats worn under their saris by Parsi women. As you can see um, evidence here of, this is Lady Mehrbai Tata, uh, this is Cornelia Saurabhji, um, all distinguished uh, Parsi women. Instead of uh, wearing the palu over the right shoulder, uh, she improvised the drape by wearing the palu over the left shoulder so that the right hand remained free for courtesies. So Nyanada Nandini was also a pioneer in being one of the first elite women uh, to break the bounds of seclusion created by Zanana culture and also encouraged other women to adopt this drape through articles published in a magazine called the Bamabodini Patrika. Now Parsi women, like the European counterparts, did not live in Zananas, that is the inner rooms of a household reserved for women in the family where they lived secluded away from public life and scrutiny. Instead, it was part of their role as women, especially as wives, to participate in social life. Zananas, considered an Indo-Islamic practice, had a decided impact on the clothing of women in general. 
the, for instance, this is evident uh, in, I mean, we get a glimpse of how Zenana culture must have influenced clothing practices from the Welsh travel writer, Fanny Parks. Um, when she went to a party in Bengal in 1826, she was astonished at seeing how the Bengali women were dressed there. Um, I quote her, on beholding their attire, I was no longer surprised that no other men than their husbands were permitted to enter the Zanana. The dress consisted of one long strip of Banaras gauze of thin texture with a gold border passed twice around the limbs with the end thrown over the shoulder. The dress was rather transparent, almost useless as a veil. New forms of mobility, and I end quote, new forms of mobility and participation in public life led to gradual changes in the sartorial practices of women. Uh, these changes were, of course, much slower compared to the changes in male attire and were more rapidly assimilated in the years following independence as the Navisari uh, did gain widespread popularity uh, after the 1940s. Now, despite evidence pointing to Nyana Nandini having uh, adapted and developing the modern Navy drape in the 1860s, women were notably reluctant to adopt the Navy drape, uh, especially over other traditional drapes. Uh, for instance, this is an excerpt from the uh, autobiography of J.S. Sardesai, a Marathi historian. And um, what's interesting about this bit is that this is actually not by Sardesai. Here he has excerpted from his wife Lakshmi by his journal to sort of give us a glimpse into the prevailing sartorial dilemmas at the turn of the century. So this is an entry from October 1910. And on, it is actually worth reproducing the entry here in full. My husband thinks that I should wear my sari according to the new fashion without one end tucked up behind the back. Now that is how a Maharashtrian Brahmin lady would have worn um, the sari. He thinks that this that is the really respectable way. But I'm not at all enthusiastic about the idea and find it very difficult to change to a new fashion after all these years. But I'm afraid he's not going to yield on this point. And I'm really nervous as to how I shall carry it off in front of the servants. Two, de two days ago, we had a violent quarrel about this. He said there was bound to be awkwardness when any new custom was introduced. I stood up for my old fashioned nine yard sari and the old way of wearing it. But he gave the example of Gujarati women who wore the shorter sari and do not keep the front part tucked up at the back. Also, he said it was lighter, easier to wash, cheaper to buy and so on. Finally, I had to give in. Then a few days later, my mother-in-law came to stay with us for some time. But she was so angry at my new way of wearing the sari that she said she would leave because she could not stand this newfangled idea. I remained silent, but my husband said if, he had to, if she had to go, she could. Some days later, I gradually gave up wearing the sari in the new way and took up my old dress. Apparently, my husband either did not notice or decided not to say anything. Now... Lakshmi Bai's resistance towards her husband's injunction to wear the new drape suggests that the Nivi Sari was a long time in becoming as popular and as ubiquitous as it became later in the 20th century. She's loath to give up her Nanyad Sari. Um, Sardi Sai's insistence on the Nivi drape is also accompanied by compelling rational arguments in favor of its convenience. It is lighter, easier to take care of, cheaper and such. He also evokes the question of respectability, demonstrating that conflicting regimes of sartorial decency are already at play. He's so convinced by this drape that he's willing to oppose his own mother on the issue. But Lakshmi Bai's silent resentment at being forced into this new drape resonates in this small passage, also because it places her at odds with her mother-in-law. In both Jnana Dhanandani and Lakshmi Bai's cases, the husbands advocate strong cases for discarding more cumbersome traditional drapes and adopting newer styles with varying degrees of success. Now, Sardesai Sai published this autobiography in 1956, and his decision to include these excerpts from his wife's journals, even if they illuminate episodes of conflict, tell us that he felt eventually vindicated in the position that he took in favoring a garment that bespoke India's nascent modernity. Now, uh, the popularity of the Navi Sari rose exponentially in urban areas, especially in the post-independence era. And uh, we have one study uh, by Justina Singh, I think from UPenn, uh, from the, to sort of 
give us some evidence from the 1960s. The study confirmed that women, depending on the degree of education and access to communication, were increasingly adopting the Navi Sari as opposed to the regional rapes of their mothers and grandmothers. Uh, besides also being less aware of the symbolic motives, meaning of the motives and colors, and guided more by fashion with several kinds of dress in their wardrobes. These are uh, some popular pamphlets that circulated in the time, uh, roughly in the period between the 1940s uh, and 1950s. Um, Air India was one uh, actor that uh, is very interesting because they circulated a lot of these pamphlets and little manuals that um, essentially gave people a breakdown on how to wear the Navi Sari. What's also kind of uh, interesting about this is that I think it would be, we would be hard put to find um, magazine articles or even newspaper articles today in India that show people how to wear the Navi Sari because to a large extent, the Navi drape is considered commonplace, commonsensical, something that you can just learn from your larger female cohort, um, your mother, your grandmother, or your friends. In fact, uh, you're likelier to find resources on other regional drapes on how to drape those. But the fact that there were so many of these how-to uh, manuals circulating in this time tells us something interesting about what the Navi drape must have represented in that period. At the conference of the increasing participation of women in public life, cultural homogeneities engineered by colonial bureaucracies, print capitalism, and an incipient common visual and material culture, the Navi Sari, in spite of being an adaptation of a regional drape, took on the sheen of New India. The dress that heralded the arrival of the modern, seemingly caste less yet unmistakably Indian woman. Uh, written accounts of the possibilities that the Navi Sari would have represented for lower caste women are difficult to find. Uh, but disparate sources do indicate its importance as a garment that enabled one to shed the trapping of caste. This um, is. The, the image on the left is a feature um, in the magazine Eve's Weekly, and it, uh, the illustration was prepared by the lady on the right. The lady on the right is Bhano Ataya, a very famous costume designer uh, who had, uh, I think, who won probably India's first ever Oscar and who had a tremendous impact on um, fashion through the medium or the lens of cinema. But I picked up this image because of the way the sari itself has been kind of styled like a dress here. And again, speaking to its kind of cos the, the, its, its fluidity in being able to inhabit a kind of cosmopolitan visual template. Ironically, although it represents a form of traditional dress for many Indian women today, it is probably one of the first truly modern forms of dress to emerge from independent India. These are features from Life Magazine circa 1945. Um, and again, uh, Life Magazine was an American magazine. And this also speaks to efforts to create a transnational appeal for the Navi Sari, the Navi Drape, as is portrayed here. This is another kind of uh, feature that appeared in Life Magazine, which once again shows um, readers and viewers how to drape the Navi Sari. So in a sense, these are the inspiration for me to sort of make a case for drape as a form of craft. This print culture treated drape as a form of craft and in hindsight does not take for granted the knowledge of the universe, uh, Navi Sari as widespread and universal. Here, I also want to make a few remarks uh, that are based on personal experience of having worn uh, the Navi drape pretty much my entire adult life. Uh, the Navi Sari's biggest marker of difference uh, from many traditional drapes is the fact that it does not drape between the legs. Uh, its widespread adoption also signals changes in forms of uh, mobility for women. So for instance, you cannot ride a bike uh, or, or do field labor. You can ride certain kinds of bikes, but you cannot ride the kind of bike where there's a bar in the middle or do field labor in the Navi Sari. However, you can operate machinery indoors. You can do any work that involves sitting, standing, or walking. For many women uh, in India, it is a point of pride that once born in the morning, the Navi Sari can be counted on to more or less stay in place for an entire day that would involve both outside work and domestic chores. Um, and in that sense, the Navi Sari also sort of uh, signals a kind of transitional moment uh, for women uh, from doing agricultural work to industrial work that 
that it was a drape that was compatible with many forms of industrial work. It all also allowed for easy assimilation into a cosmopolitan visual template uh, due to its resemblance or its kind of simulated resemblance to a dress. Uh, most importantly, it integrated and assimilated the blouse into an essential part of the sari ensemble. So before I talk a little bit more about the blouse associated with the Navi sari, we will briefly take an ex a historical excursion into the blouse. Now, uh, before I go into the historical excursion, I just want to say that the picture on the left is a picture of my mother from circa 1984. And uh, the picture on the right is a picture of me from my doctoral defense. And uh, uh, I put up these pictures because I want to make specific points about the blouse. I will get to them in a little bit. Emma Tarlo, um, the, the British anthropologist who, uh, again, is, is kind of a pioneer in the field of dress studies, opens her book, Clothing Matters, with a fairly disturbing description of how Tosco Pepe, the photographer in 1872, coaxed shy women from the Juang Hills in Nagpur into submitting to be photographed. Now, these uh, women were unclothed. The resulting photograph is representative of Western fascination with the unclothed native body around this time. But more importantly, she also alludes to how uncommon being nearly naked would soon become for these women to the caricature extent that ethnographers had to manufacture what they perceived to be their authentic way of being by literally asking them to disprove for photographs. Now the sari blouse is part of this contentious history. Its origins are difficult and murky to pinpoint precisely. Uh, very often, dress history tends to attribute uh, specific points, um, such as, say, Victorian influence or Islamic influence to the kind of advent of the sorry, uh, advent of the blouse itself or practices of upper, covering the um, upper body. Normalization of the blouse then was predicated on distinct but interrelated factors, such as the knowledge and prevalence of stitched clothing, external factors such as the weather and uh, norms around covering the upper body. Uh, the latter in turn depended on a variety of shifting contexts and norms, the degrees to which the seclusion and veiling of women was prevalent, changing notions of decency and respectability around the female body. Now, uh, this debate has unwittingly become polarized in, in, in a sense that there is a tendency to ascribe this to a definitive political or social change, such as Islamic or Victorian cultural domination, uh, or a sometimes related tendency to claim a definitive temporal stage when the blouse invariably manifested its presence. But what I suggest instead is that the blouse is part of a sartorial ensemble, coexisted along, alongside the practice of going bare-breasted for several centuries. So it is the Navi drape that eventually uh, integrated the blouse as an essential part of the sari ensemble. Now, if you look at some of the images I showed you earlier, like even from here, you can see that blouses came in a variety of shapes and sizes, but there was some standardization and some normalization even here. The blouse, for instance, that my mother is wearing in this image, uh, it has been tailored for her and it represents a certain fashion of the time. Uh, this is where um, I want to talk a little bit about uh, norms of tailoring around the blouse. Now, um, the claim that I also wish to make uh, around this is that tailoring has been invisibilized as a craft. Um, we've devoted a lot of attention to weaving, but the advent and the kind of uh, popularization of tailoring as a very accessible uh, skill has been invisibilized as craft. Uh, let me show you a blouse, for instance. Now, there are some aspects of this blouse that I wish to. This is a blouse of mine. It was tailored for me by a professional tailor in India. There are aspects of this blouse that um, I wish to bring to your attention. First of all, it is um, stitched to uh, fit snugly around the upper body, especially around the breasts. So it, it is a fit, stitched to kind of tailor to kind of contour around the breasts. And um, there are certain um, ways in which this garment itself reveals norms of decency. This is, for instance, um, a loop that many professional tailors in India will provide for you. And it is meant to conceal the bra strap, prevent it from peeking outside the blouse. The blouse is, of course, fairly short, so it is also meant to reveal the navel. There are certain things, aspects of this blouse that I'll be able to negotiate with the tailor, such as, for instance, the depth of the neckline, the depth of the back. But very often, it has been a struggle for me to negotiate the overall fit. 
If I ask for a looser fit, the tailor will see it as a matter of professional disrepute and will very often refuse to give me a looser fit. Um, that is something that I will have to negotiate with the tailor. Uh, for my doctoral defense, I did not have access to um, uh, an Indian professional tailor, but I still wanted a fitted blouse. So I improvised and chose jersey cloth instead in order to create the same kind of fit. Now, um, th these are some pointers that uh, will also will talk, will tell us a lot about the normalization and the popularization of tailoring as a skill, as an easily available and accessible skill. And also how that skill um, adapts itself to cultural and social norms. So whereas uh, you see the blouses come in a variety of sizes and shapes in the archive, uh, there was a certain element of standardization that came into the blouse. And uh, the advent of the Singer sewing machine especially affords us a glimpse into the normalization of tailoring in the late 19th century. Um, tailoring is also widely and cheaply available skill in India and perhaps this Um, a blouse can be stitched for as cheaply as 20 rupees, which um, to give you some context, for instance, the average uh, wage of an agricultural laborer in India is about rupees 240. So uh, 20 rupees from that uh, should give you some idea as to how cheaply this skill is available in India today. There are tailors, very often men, who can stitch a form-fitted blouse for you on the basis of your bra size alone, that they will not need any other measurement than that. And tailoring is often a supplementary source of income for many homemakers. So the Navi drape then also engendered other forms of craft, such as tailoring. And um, although they may not be recognized as such, these two constitute a form of craft. So uh, this, this image is, of course, from the Border and Fall uh, anthology of drape series. I wish to conclude this talk by saying that um, drape has a certain salience as a form of craft. Uh, craft studies in general has shown considerable attention and careful attention to how objects are made. But uh, in terms of telling larger stories around craft, we also need to pay attention to how objects are used repurposed, cared for, maintained, discarded. And looking at drape as a form of craft allows us to unearth and tell those stories as well. Drape broadens our understanding of craft beyond how objects are made. Uh, and in the case of the Navi Sari, the, the drape uh, and, and the drape that was engineered, the kind of dress that was eventually engineered um, also fostered and supported other forms of craft such as tailoring. Now, uh, the key question to ask here is, does this dilute definitions of craft at a time when other forms of making themselves are in jeopardy, are endangered, are threatened? Uh, and I would say no, because we can see that this cultural history tells us that this broadened understanding allows us to unearth new forms and other forms of making and uh, look at how they're popularized from how objects are used. It also allows us to see and understand how objects are upcycled. So uh, the culture of repurposing different kinds of clothing into a, a blouse is centered on the tailor and the tailor's skill. Uh, I would also say that we need to steer away from creating or unwittingly creating a hierarchy of value that places freshly made objects uh, at the top and repurposed objects at the bottom. The human need for novelty will ensure that new forms of ingenuity in, in, in drape, in, in tailoring, and in um, all other forms of making and using will continue to thrive. So um, on that note, I will say thank you for listening. And I'd love to hear your thoughts on any questions that you might have. Wonderful. Thank you so much, uh, Kamya, for that. And if you want to stop sharing your screen, we can gather together on our screen and talk about uh, your your paper, your very interesting paper. And I invite anyone who's got questions or comments to make for Kamya to, to come forward. Um, and maybe, maybe while you're doing that and thinking of them, if I could fill the space for a moment, Kamya, I, I'm very curious about the relationship between the drape and the Roman toga, uh, which is a different gender, obviously. And uh, 
by, by legend, one of the aspects of the Roman toga is that it was restricted to upper class Romans and the actual drape of the toga was, was quite complex. I think it involved 32 folds by, by my memory, might be wrong. And so it was a kind of a sign of your status to be able to actually wear it in the first place, to have the knowledge to be able to drape it appropriately. And I guess that that relates to the question of the, the of, of sumptuary laws in consumption. Mm -hmm. uh, there might be codes, whether implicit or explicit, about uh, which level of society can wear or consume different elements. And there can be overt ones, like I think there was in Renaissance England, uh, a, uh, only royals could wear pearls, for instance, and that was a very <laughs> clear one. But there can be implicit ones, which are about the the skill necessary to be able to, to use an item in a particular way is limited to certain groups within society. So with the, the idea of drape as a craft, now craft is something we normally assume involves a skill of some kind. Um, mm -hmm. What, how do you read the Nivy drape in that? Was it, did it, is it popular? Cause it was a very simple one that anyone could, 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 could drape for themselves and did it distinguish from regional drapes that were more complex and involved an in initiation of some kind? How do you read the, the drape in terms of, of skill? Uh, hi, thanks, Kevin. So um, in terms of, in terms of uh, skill and in terms of ease of wearing, I place a Nivy drape somewhere. Um, I would still say it is on the easier spectrum of, of of the drapes that we have in India, it, it's still relatively easier, but it's it's definitely, I mean, I definitely know of drapes that are easier than the Navi drape. So I'm guessing that ease and convenience was one factor amongst many in terms of uh, its widespread adoption, uh, especially for the upper caste women. So for instance, the, the Lakshmi Bai, who was an upper caste, she was a Maharashtrian Brahmin. So for her, for instance, for anyone who uh, was, reared the way she was. The transition from a, a nine-yard sari that kind of drapes between the legs in this very intricate and complicated manner to the Nivi drape, I'm guessing must definitely have represented uh, a shift towards ease and convenience. Uh, I, I have tried the, the, the more elaborate drapes and many of them are extremely inconvenient for any kind of mobility or everyday use. So in that sense that I, I but I would also say that uh, wearing the Navi drape itself is, is a kind of um, a skill because it's something that just as with any other kind of craft, you get better at uh, when you do in an iterative and conscious manner. Many young women today in India are completely daunted by the prospect of wearing even the Navi drape and uh, would rather not attempt it at all because um, yes, I think there is an element of skill involved. I also found, I mean, your comment on sumptuary laws in general was very interesting because um, the problem with studying clothing is that very often uh, it's one of those uh, completely uh, common sensified, taken for granted, embedded in the routines and infrastructures of our lives that we do not feel the need to explicate in any way. So as a scholar who's studying clothing practices, this can often be very difficult. So sumptuary laws, especially if they're coded, can give you very useful insights into, you know, what were the kind of uh, prohibitions, proscriptions, um, what were the kind of hierarchies, divides, social divides in the time. So I do think that, for instance, uh, in Europe, I think in Ireland, there were proscriptions around color. Certain people were prohibited from wearing certain colors. And there, one can also find instances of similar things uh, in India, but um, in general, I feel that like the documentation is so scarce even there. I think Giorgio Riallo, the clothing historian has a good book on sumptuary laws, especially in Europe. But I think a similar effort for uh, the Indian subcontinent has yet to happen. Mm, good. Um, Ashima, Kaushik, you have a question, do you? Uh, hello, Kevin. Hello, Pamela. Thank you for your lovely year. Uh, I actually, uh, I don't have a question, but I wanted to add to something that you were saying, if you allow me. Please. Uh, 
yeah uh, uh, this conversation reminded me of um do you know about the breast tax that was imposed on uh, low caste women in the kingdom of travancore yes so uh, around that time uh, lower caste women were forced to uh, go around uh, do their chores um, topless and if at all they wanted to cover their breasts they were supposed to pay a tax and the tax was so high that of course it would put them in a great amount of debt so um, women around uh, roamed around uh, topless and um, at the same time the brahmins or the nayars of uh, the kingdom of Tra- travancore they dressed decently and modestly and uh, later there was a woman who was called uh, nangeli uh, to as a form of resistance she cut off her dresses and uh, presented them to the lord uh, on a plaintive leave as a form of resistance yeah um thanks so much uh, ashima for bringing this up so this is actually a very interesting um, snippet in history i think uh, you refer to sort of the period between um, the sort of this is roughly the period that i've been talking about in my talk as well which is the mid 19th century and the context for this uh, you are absolutely right in that uh, lower caste women especially women from the shanar community um, were prohibited from um, sort of uh, well let me just break this down for uh, everyone in the audience essentially what happened was that uh, in the time uh, low caste women would typically be bare breasted but uh, with the kind of missionizing influence that was prevalent in the state of travancore many low caste women converted to christianity now victorian norms of decency dictated that they were start wearing a blouse uh once they started adopting the blouse or wearing some kind of breast cloth to sort of cover their breasts because that was the victorian norm of decency uh upper castes in the in the vicinity took umbrage at this because at that point uh, bearing your breasts was a sign that you acknowledged someone to be your social superior so uh, many upper castes saw this as an affront or or a threat to the hierarchy and would often well in fact there are uh, records of riots taking place in marketplaces at the time when lower caste women would show up covered people would literally forcibly remove the breast cloth or the blouse that they were wearing because they were not entitled in the upper caste view to uh, essentially um, cover their breasts and i think this speaks very much to sort of what i've been talking about the shifting norms of decency and respectability around covering or bearing your upper body and how this is not always um, self evident or well uh, easy to understand outside of that particular cultural context i think eventually it was resolved with the queen's proclamation uh, after the great indian revolt of 1858 and the queen's proclamation was essentially to say you know hands off we will uh, not interfere in uh, local practices and customs and it was it was meant to send a warning even to the christian missionaries to stop sort of uh, engendering any kind of social reform that would upset the existing hierarchy uh yeah but that that is uh, an extremely interesting piece of history that's very relevant for any kind of understanding of sartorial norms in india Wow, that's a dramatic story. Ben. <laughs> hey, Camilla, thanks a lot for the fascinating talk. Um, I learned a bunch and, and, and um, much to think about um, in the way that news um, is, is creating new forms of craft, which I think is a, is a super interesting idea. I had a question about uh, a moment where you speak about the, the fact that the sari you know ushers into um india the sort of modern classless woman which a statement that you immediately sort of you know question but i was wondering whether um either choice of cloth or the addition of of jewelry on top of the sari which we haven't sort of seen in the pictures whether that would have been a way for women to then re reinject class um consciousness or distinctions in the way they were wearing uh, their sari Uh, uh thank you so much for this question ben and in fact i i feel like it um speaks very much to uh 
the another strand of research which which I, I think Kevin made a reference uh, to that when, when I talk about fabric as something that serves as a class marker and very often as a social gatekeeper so I think this is very much the case but even here uh, it's not very straightforward so very often like um, in Tamil Nadu in southern India let me give you an example from there uh, upper caste elite women who have um, in how we would understand it in general parlance today, who have cultural capital, will very often advocate for uh, cotton and other natural fibers and will look down on polyester or nylon. But um, for uh, there, is, there is history in Tamil Nadu to show that uh, for a, a large, for a, for a, a majority of the working classes, uh, synthetic fibers represented a kind of class mobility represented um, a move away from what they per perceived to be impoverished cotton. So, so uh, this is also kind of the irony of this entire thing, right? Like you can create uh, taste templates to sort of uh, socially gatekeep, but if those taste templates are not universally recognized and they will not be because the human need for novelty will sort of transcend any kind of taste template that you can uh, impose on people. And so if, if the, they are not universalizable, they will not really hold. Um, so in that sense, I think your the drape, while it, it, it encases possibilities for democratization, for widespread access, there are ways in which you can code class and caste even. Perhaps, I'm not even sure you can code caste, but I think you can code class for sure into um, drapes, I mean, into the sari. I mean, Thanks, just, Kamina. The, the, there was another bit of the question, which was about jewelry. Um, and this may be relevant, and if it is, forget about it. But I just wonder why we saw so little of it on top of the sari. You mean from the images in the presentation? Hmm. Hmm. Interesting. Uh, I don't think that was intentional, by the way. Uh, but I do think that you may be speaking to the fact that a lot of the images that I picked up, especially from the 1940s and 50s, were uh, images that were in some ways for a workplace or an official or a formal context. And perhaps that was just one of the ways in which the sari was adapted to those contexts uh, through the removal. There's also, you know, this is also interesting in the context of how um, these uh, Western Orientalists especially perceived the uh, Indian art and Indian sculpture. Very often there was criticism of uh, over embellishment. There was criticism of what they perceived to be grotesquerie. And so these, these, I'm surmising, I'm speculating here at this point, but these could just have been uh, ways in which they sought to create a modern template. And there was also, there's also evidence uh, from the 20th century, I think from the 1920s onwards, um, a sort of broader consumer preference for simpler, less embellished designs in general. And this also could possibly have extended to jewelry itself. I am speaking of textiles, but it is also possible that this could have manifested in jewelry. Thank you so much. I wonder if uh, anyone's got any other thoughts about uh, various other forms of, of dress that might be compared, the kimono, for instance, or Arab dress, uh, just to think about that if you've got something to, to compare. But meanwhile, Mitra Trabais, good to see you. Wonderful. Yeah, likewise, to, it's, it's uh, good to see you. It was a, uh, although I was, uh, I haven't been a part of the whole talk, uh, I came through in between, but the talk was um, very enlightening for me because this is not a topic that I have delved into before. Um, but I was just a bit curious to sort of add to what um, Ben recently asked about jewelry. And uh, Kamya, please correct me uh, if I've not got it uh, in the right sense. But I think when you're talking about the Navi drape uh, being sort of the new drape for uh, an entire mass uh, of in, in India, uh, when it comes to jewelry, the jewelry is very uh, personalized, like it, uh, 
from depending on culture to culture, which is mm -hmm. very, um, uh, very sort of different in in even a uh, short, like small span of area. So I think just uh, to make it more appealing to a larger mass, they could have probably not um, sort of put jewelry because if if you add to that, then how many like uh, all the different states and a lot of um, geographical areas within mm -hmm. the states have have you know like different um, culture to represent in terms of jewelry. So that was my thought. That's probably why they would not have um, sort of decked the women with the drapes in jewelry, so to say. So uh, that that I think that's a very uh, very valuable perspective, and I'd be inclined to agree with you actually. Um, as you were speaking, I was also thinking of uh, Rani Gayatri Devi and how her, uh, you know, string of pearls with the chiffon yeah. body and how that just became uh, extremely popular at one point. Um, but I think we might also find clues in cinema because I, I feel like especially um, cinema in India was very skillful at sort of adapting something that, that is very localized and regional and specific and somehow rendering it um, appealing to larger to audience. Mass. Yeah. 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 yeah, so, yeah. Yeah, but it was a really good talk and thank you for that. Thanks so much. Thanks. Uh, great to have you, yeah. Well, we're coming to the, to the hour, just checking if anyone else has uh, any other comments or thoughts to add. But I do see, Kamya, that, you know, what you're, what you're doing does you know, open up a lot of questions beyond, uh, as you say, the the freshly made item to how it then becomes part of life in different contexts. And uh, I think we'll have an interesting series of reflections to follow that. But meanwhile, Sharon, you have a comment. Um, yes, I have a quick question, if I may. Thank you so much for the talk and the sharing. Very, very interesting. Um, I'm, I'm wondering if you've looked into how the um, Navi Sari has um, impact or the, its popularity has impact the production mm -hmm. um, workforce of Sari um, because of how you know it's worn differently, the design and, and the weaver's involvement. Um, have, can you comment on anything like that? Thanks so much for this. Um, so yeah, there's, there's a, an entire uh, a story to pursue there in terms of how uh, well histories of production and histories of the adoption of the drape interact with each other and I didn't go into too much detail about that in this talk but um, to uh, very quickly offer some perspective uh, in terms of your question there is this debate in India about um, hand looms and power looms and this debate is very old it's very tired in some ways it's regurgitated in very kind of I feel very ignorant ways, but uh, this debate is also especially relevant for this time between say 1880 and 1940. Uh, many, many people actually mistakenly see this time as having been bad for the hand looms because of the advent of the power looms. The first kind of big textile mills were being set up in India. Um, and that is, that is, it is, it is not possible to entirely say that because the handlooms also benefited from partial mechanization. They benefited from uh, access to new materials from exports and all that. But to come to your question, uh, I think there is definitely evidence to say that uh, the setting up of the mills, uh, power loom production, the fact that it just accelerated production to uh, a much greater degree than was previously possible with handlooms definitely aided um, the availability of uh, the sari, the navi drape, especially because the navi drape is roughly about five and a half to six yards. And this yardage was also something that was uh, very easy for the power loom to standardize and to produce on a much larger scale. Uh, what I was talking about with reference to Ben's question that there was at this time uh, a shift in consumer preferences from highly embellished forms of cloth uh, to kind of simpler designs to plain, light colored, often very plain, just like um, unembellished, unvarnished cloth in general. There is evidence to indicate that there was this kind of consumer shift. And this also is something that the power looms benefited from because 
the uh, the handlooms essentially e excelled at distinguishing the, the distinguishing themselves when there was highly embellished highly ornamental forms of cloth but the paulums were very good at producing this kind of plain cloth and with consumer uh, preferences shifting this way this also enabled them to produce and sell more sarees and this in turn uh, aided kind of the popularization of the navy drape so it is actually an extremely important and, and uh, relevant question for this time the mills played a very big role in in the standardization and the popularization of the navy drape thank you so much and i wonder if these businesses actually took place in the sort of marketing of um, this clothing. So, so it's not just a bottom-up um, interest, it's definitely uh, mutual in encouraging that popularization. Oh, absolutely. It, 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 I think it was definitely mutual. I think uh, also a lot of the kind of mill owners, the capitalists, so to speak, of this time were very intelligent at reading and understanding the market and shifts in the market mm. so they were also responding to that um yeah and the fact that people could just buy more for less i'm sure must have made a massive difference uh, i think there is this report from 1942 where uh, they go and talk to these women in madras many of them are college going urban women and they have anywhere between six to twelve saris in their wardrobe and just 40 years back that would have been maybe one or two saris Mm. So the fact that people could own more for less money also must have made a significant impact in kind of, um, so it is a kind of symbiotic story in that sense that the drape aided certain forms of production because it was a, it was made for a shorter sari, a more standardizable sari. And in turn, those forms of production made it possible for more people to own this kind of sari and wear this kind of drape. Mm. Thank you so much. Good. Thank you. Madhuri. Hi, thank you so much, Kamya. Really enjoyed your talk. Um, um, in um, continuation with your research, I was wondering if uh, you, if, if, if actually the Navy or the, the changing notions of modernity and the sari, if you see um, parallelly, right? The relevance of the Navy today, you mm -hmm. know, in the sense that uh, thanks to, I think, um, uh, the changing narrative through social media and this influencers culture, right? The fact that how many, and like like you mentioned, border and fall as well, right? The fact that uh, you're going back to your roots, figuring out, you know, whether my grandmother wore it, uh, the kachha drape, or, you know, like uh, mm -hmm. in any other way, right? Or the ulta palla, et cetera. So um, the relevance of um, the Nivi today, is it actually going back? The fact that, you know, from being an exception, it's become the rule today, right? Mm -hmm. We don't know of any other uh, drape than the Navy. It's very tough for us, even if you are quite accustomed to wearing a sari, right? You'll have to rethink it if you're going to wear it in a different way. So um, uh, with respect to that, uh, what are your thoughts on that? You know, like, uh, do you see, uh, uh, do you see the, I mean, uh, you know, the idea that, Maybe uh, are we going to go back to our traditional drapes or uh, how do you make sense of that? That's one part. And secondly, I was also thinking of how interesting um, the sari as being accommodative of a changing uh, a changing woman's body. Right? I mean, the, the how the woman's body changes through her life cycle, whether it's like giving birth and, you know, or just putting on weight, like we say, right? So, um, and then even the, even the blouse is very interesting. If we, interestingly, if you see like today, how we have like stitched to a particular size and then loosening it becomes a problem a couple of, if you put on a couple of kids. So whereas in the past, the cholis, et cetera, right? They had just the dories or something you could tie mm -hmm. them with. So uh, how interesting that most of uh, traditional Indian clothing, even jewelry, like we are speaking of it, actually were very accommodative of this, right? Mm -hmm. Whether you whether you talk of a baju band, whether you talk of a necklace which came with tassels rather than, you know, a particular, you can wear it only at this uh, thing. So um, um, have, have you also looked at the Nivi as being accommodative of that? Because I think generally a sari is, but I, uh, I mean, that's an, uh, there are two questions or two observations actually in this one, but uh, yeah, I'd like to thank you again. It was really nice. Uh, 
thank you madhuri those are uh, great questions and uh, actually there is something that i wanted to show during the show and tell but i forgot and you very nicely reminded me of it but uh, what madhuri is talking about in terms of uh, how the sari is accommodative and this is easy enough to do with drape but i also find it pretty uh, impressive that many tailors manage to a reasonable degree to do this with even the stitched blouse it may not offer the degree of flexibility that the the dori blouses would definitely but the level of give that often comes for uh, even even any kind of drape that any kind of blouse that you get tailored in india is seriously impressive and there is the assumption of the norm that you know like uh, young women will get married and will then gain weight there is this idea that after marriage you will gain weight and that is accounted for in the blouse um in terms of like uh, the the this is a much harder question to answer right madhuri the the uh, where do we see the navy drape going from here i am like for people who are afraid that it will disappear i i am not uh, a doomsday prophet in that sense i feel that it will be around but from i think it it has changed and it will continue to change in the sense that it's interesting to me that it exemplified convenience for people at a certain time 70 80 90 years back but i don't think it will do that anymore it it may become it has already become the new traditional in that sense that this is the garment that many women in india reach out to when they want to wear something traditional um so uh, i think the very traditional drapes uh, unless the community or the that social space is highly insular or or people deliberately make efforts to sort of adopt that rape i don't see them uh, kind of gaining popular appeal but i do think that the navy drape will be around but will perhaps not exemplify convenience and comfort the way it did 70 80 years back that is my speculation thank you for that madhuri and thank you for that kamya it's been a wonderful presentation and i think it does resonate back with previous talks because uh uh there've been a number of presentations that reflect the question of use i'm thinking back to layla alhamad's talk on scent in arab culture uh which is very much around the the uses of of smell in rituals of everyday life and society in in the arab states and we're going beyond there the the making to the the consumption of it as something which is involves an element of skill and and choice and and meaning and i think this reflects a kind of broadening from from craft as a as a field of art where the objects are are, are collected and don't really have a a place in everyday life to thinking about it's it's much more rich well Uh, not rich necessarily but much more diverse way in which we engage with it and the need to consider use among that also perhaps relates to what uh, Sachiko Tamashiga was saying about the the mirror in Shinto that it's part of the rituals of uh, Shinto as well as being something which is skillfully made but i think you've helped crystallize that kamya which has been really a wonderful contribution and i thank you so much and thanks everyone else for for being part of it and uh, have a good day thanks thank you so much kevin thanks everyone